Welcome, everyone. This is uh, the 3rd of March, 2022. And I have with me here a very special guest. This man is David Gallup, and he is the man that is uh, running the, uh, the World Service Authority, which is the issuing authority on the World Passport and a lot of other interesting documents. And as you know, uh, most of my um, audience is within the, in the sovereign movement and wants to know more about how to you know, get out of the, the straitjacket of state uh, control uh, lifestyle. So um, I would like to really, um, I'm very excited for this meeting because I've been looking forward to this because uh, I came to, to learn about your passport. I think it was in 2018 on a, a David Wynn Miller uh, course. And um, I've been following it since and got my own and uh, have some dialogue with you also. And But I was really excited to get you on because I know that the World Passport is about the human rights and that's also a lot what we are about. So um, I would just like to ask you into how did you, how did all this come about and and how did you get involved in this whole um, world citizen, world passport. Sure. Well, Henrik, thank you so much for having me on today and to speak with, with you and uh, the, your followers, listeners, um, and viewers. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here today to talk about world citizenship, uh, universal respect for our universal rights. So I'll start uh, with talking about how this organization came to be or why there's even a, a world passport. It really dates back to uh, 1945, or actually even earlier, there was a man named Gary Davis, who uh, was uh, an actor on Broadway. Uh, he, his parents were uh, socialites, and his father was a, a, actually a, an orchestra leader who played at various inaugurations for, about, I think, five different presidents here in the United States. So they were uh, very much into to, you know, Broadway and acting and all. And But Gary's brother was uh, enlisted uh, uh, to be uh, uh, in the uh, Navy uh, in World War II around 1941, I guess it was. Uh, and his brother was killed on a battleship in Salerno. And that was really devastating to Gary. And it made him extremely angry, actually. And, and Gary decided, well, look, I'm going to go into the Air Force and I'm going to bomb Hitler's war factories, sort of as, as revenge was really what he felt. Uh, so he had to sort of leave all the, his acting and his comedy behind. Uh, to become a, somebody who would be in a uniform, in a military, and, and in a bomber plane. So once he got up into that plane and was dropping bombs on Brandenburg, you know, from 19,000 feet in the air, you know, he didn't really know exactly what was happening because you, you couldn't obviously see down uh, the, the devastation until he came back home and saw the pictures of the devastation. And he was uh, distraught, totally uh, horrified by what he had done, killing his fellow humans, really. You know, he, his brother was killed. And no one went to jail for murder for killing his brother. And he killed he killed brothers and 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 sisters and uh, mothers and fathers and children uh, with the bombs that he dropped. And he didn't go to jail for murder because during war, uh, you as a uh, person in the army or military, you are paid to kill. Really, I mean that's that's your job. Uh, and the international humanitarian law allows for killing, basically. Uh, and so when he came back, he was totally disillusioned with the whole war system. He had, uh, you might say now, uh, he was shell-shocked is what they said then. Now we would call it post-traumatic uh, stress from the war. Uh, he couldn't, he really couldn't get back into acting because he was so uh, really depressed about everything that happened. So he said, look, I need to get out of this war system. And he read a book uh, called, uh, let me see, do I have, a, I should have a copy of it here. Yeah, um, Anatomy of Peace by Emery Reeves, or Revish is, I guess, how it's pronounced. And this book was a, a bestseller back in 1945, uh, right, especially right after the, the bombs were dropped on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So he re read this book. And uh, so there are really three reasons why we exist, why World Service Authority exists to issue these passports and to promote universal rights and world citizenship. One, his brother being killed uh, during the war, to the killing that he did, and three, his having read this book and said, well, wow, 
Emery re Ravisher gets the idea of really what we need. He said, there is no first step to world government. World government is the first step, meaning we need to, and people are afraid of the term world government. So we maybe use it differently than, than how people in the so, so, you know, who are claiming sovereignty might be afraid of that. But that's not how we use it. When we say world government, we mean government of, by, and for the people of the world to move beyond the, the nation states that are killing us or that are making us kill in a sense. So he said, look, what can I do? And as an actor, as a comedian, he said, I have to do a bold gesture. So he was able to fly to Paris. Uh, he tried to renounce his US citizenship by uh, giving in, handing in his US passport and being given, you know, raising his hand and giving the oath of renunciation. But the, the, but the uh, chief consular officer at the, at the uh, American embassy in Paris said, well, Mr. Davis, uh, you know, uh, let's, why don't you, you know, calm down, come back in a few days. Let's think about this. Because in the meantime, his father was sending telexes. To, you know, Gary was a war hero. Don't let him, don't let him give up his citizenship, you know? Uh, and, and that might've been an embarrassment to his family who was you know, in, in the media, even at that point. So, um, so he went back three days later and, he, and the woman at the embassy was like, well, you know, why are you back here, Mr. Davis? Like, well, I'm here to give up my citizenship like I was a few days ago. And she's like, oh, you know, please, you know, get a level head, relax. And she's like, look, if you don't give me the oath of renunciation in the next five minutes, I'm going to call your superiors in Washington and I'll let them know that this is dereliction of duty and you're going to get fired. <laughs> so she's like, okay. So she looked through her desk, found the, you know, the oath of renunciation. You know, he raised his hand. Uh, he was given the oath. And of course, he get, had to hand in his U.S. passport. So he was left in France with no documents. The second he stepped out of the consulate at the embassy, he was delighted. You know, he, he was free in a sense. He gave up the 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 document that was enslaving him in a sense that was forcing him to be something that he no longer wanted to be because that killed his brother that made him kill. So um, this was great right at the beginning, but then he realized, uh-oh, I'm here in France without any documents and people who have no documents, and this is still true to this day, are considered illegal. Well, no human being should be considered ever illegal just because you don't have a piece of paper. That's ridiculous. And I know one of the jobs that you are trying to do is to help people to self-identify, to create self-sovereign documents that will allow you and me and anyone to create documents that are valid just because we recognize them. We have said, this is who I am and we claim it, right? And that's in a sense what the World Passport is about too. So uh, he had to figure out something, but fortunately what happened was the UN was coming to Paris, uh, this was 1948, uh, to have its General Assembly meetings because the building on the Hudson River in New York had not been finished, had not been completely built yet, right? Mm -hmm. So they came to Paris and Gary heard about this and then he heard that the mayor of Paris uh, had declared the area around the Palais de Chaillot, which is the U-shaped building across from the Eiffel Tower where the UN was meeting as international territory. And Gary said, hmm, well, where should I as a world citizen go? Well, I'll go to international territory because it's no longer France. It's, you might say, world territory. So uh, he decided, okay, I'm going to go there. And he found there was a steps right outside of the UN commissary, the, the place where people would go to have their lunch or dinner, or whatever, within the uh, Palais de Chaillot, and basically started camping out there. And you know, then the media started coming, and he get, was getting more press than what was going on inside the chambers than, than they were. And the French loved it. They brought him bottles of wine, fromage, you know, cheese and baguettes and, and supplied him with a tent even. Um, and basically hey, he held his ground uh, on, on those uh, steps of the Palais de Chaillot just right outside the commissary uh, for um, basically uh, six nights and seven days. Uh, and, uh, but near the end of it, he was getting literally these big bags of mail uh, from postcards from people all around saying, I support you, uh, you know, Gary Davis. I don't support those squabbling of nations, those warring of nations where they're just, you know, talking about things but aren't resolving anything. It's going to lead to another war. Uh, so uh, then, of course, the French, well, so, you know, some like the UN police would come to him and say, look, you can't be here. And, and he said, well, if you try to take me out and bring me back into France, that will be illegal and you could be arrested and go to jail for bringing me back into France because I'm not legal there. <laughs> Finally though, they got, I don't know, 25 French gendarmes, you know, the police to come in at like a paddy wagon, took apart his tent like at six in the morning, pulled him out and threw him in the paddy wagon. So this was the whole start of, of what became uh, really a world citizen, a modern world citizenship movement. 
And it really is a movement. It's still a movement to this day, uh, promoting this idea that we are really one human family. We only have one earth. And unless we protect the earth and unless we protect humanity as one whole, we're going to kill ourselves either by destroying our, our only home, our parent earth, or by destroying each other uh, or potentially both. So uh, there's a whole bunch of other stories and, and I won't go through them now because we don't have that much time, of course, but there may be other stories I tell as we talk later on, but this is Gary's uh, memoir, My Country is the World. It's a great story. So that story that I just told you is, is told in much more detail in this book. And there's also a great new documentary called The World is My Country. And you can go to theworldismycountry.com and you can actually see a preview, a trailer of the film. It's been uh, most recently dis displayed on public television throughout the United States. About 150 different public television stations have been playing the hour version of this documentary. There's actually an hour and 23 minute version of the documentary, which I end up being in, Leonardo DiCaprio ends up being in, and a few other. There's a lot of famous people actually that Gary Davis knew because he was he was sort of dubbed by the press as world citizen number one. He became world famous. He would give speeches to people like there was a uh, there was a Vélodrome d'Hiver, which is like the, what was the biggest venue in Paris at that time uh, for big sporting events, and so he gave a speech to about twenty thousand Parisians and and other Europeans who came who came to that um, event, uh, and. There were, uh, and you know, whenever he would, he would always try to do things that would raise awareness of the fact of being in a situation that is ridiculous. I mean, being you know, quote unquote, stateless and having no documents, he should not be arrested just for having no documents. But he was actually arrested 34 times in his life for uh, his uh, activism, you might say, uh, because you, and it, sometimes people would say, will, will say in the media, oh, it's because he presented a document that wasn't recognized. Well, that's usually was not the case. He would maybe present the world passport and they might reject it. Some oftentimes they would recognize it actually uh, and let him in or give him a, a visa or an entry or exit stamp on it. But other times when he they didn't, you know, he would spend there. He sometimes would sleep out at night at the border gate, you know, just waiting, waiting them out, just like they thought he, they were going to wait him out. But, you know, and then in the middle of the night, he might sneak in on a bicycle. And then they would catch him in, in the country and then, then they would detain him because they're like, you can't just come in you know, without an official recognition, he would do it anyway. <laughs> now, that kind of thing is much harder to do nowadays, obviously, because the, the control system is much stronger and the reaction by policing and, and immigration, unfortunately, is a lot stronger than it, than, you know, it would have been back in you know, 1949, 1950. He created a registry of world citizens that registered within almost two years, almost uh, 800,000 people. And then he created the world citizen government on the steps of the Ellsworth City Hall in Ellsworth, Maine, uh, declaring a, a government of, by, and for the people of the world. And then just a few months later, that was on September 4th of 1953, on January 1st of 1954, he created World Service Authority, which is the administrative agency of this, you might say, uh, microcosmic world citizen government, because we're not really yet acting in macrocosm, or you would have heard of us before, right? Um, <laughs> But we are providing services like document issuance. We have a legal advocacy team that provides legal backup to both to people who have documents from the World Service Authority, as well as anyone. You know, if someone's in a refugee situation or in a vulnerable situation and they need us to write a legal brief or a, an affidavit of support or a legal letter, we jump into action and send them uh, documentation to support their rights. Um, so we were created to not only do that, but to continue the issuance of the, the well, to start the issuance of the World Passport. Uh, and I'll tell you about how that came to be in, the, in, in just a moment, but also to provide uh, uh, additional uh, support uh, to individuals uh, around the world, not just legal support, but educational support. So people will understand what our rights are. So we give out you know, multiple copies of this Declaration of Human Rights in multiple languages to people. You know, we give thousands and thousands every year. All, all around the world. In fact, the UN Information Center here in Washington, D.C., when they've run out of their own document, this is their the UN document, they'll, they'll call me up and say, hey, David, can we have 300 copies of that declaration? Of course, we, we walk it over to their, mail it over to their office. Um, so uh, we continue the registration of uh, world citizens in, a, in an official, legal, uh, and uh, you might even say uh, symbolic capacity, because it's both. It's both official, political, legal, and, and also symbolic. It, it, it's both. A lot of the documents we do are both practical and symbolic. So when you carry a world passport, you, you, you want to use it as a practical tool to say, look, I am a world citizen. I have universal rights. It should be universally respected. No matter where I am on planet Earth, 
So I sh I'll show you this document, but it also has the symbolic effect of perhaps changing the mind of that particular border official that you might be speaking with. Oftentimes Gary would come across border officials, and this has happened to me too, like when I went into Canada, right before COVID, I went up to Canada to a peace conference and I presented my, well, I had a US passport too, but I presented my world passport and my uh, US passport and I asked for, I, I didn't ask for a stamp. I said, please stamp my peace document. Or, and, then, and then I explained it a little bit. And the woman at the border, she's like, well, I'm new here. I've never seen this passport before. So then she starts typing on her keyboard um, and she's like, is World Service Authority a, a nonprofit organization? And I, sh I shouldn't have said, yes, we are. Uh, we're not a federal nonprofit. We're a, a local D District of Columbia nonprofit. Um, but uh, I said, yes, I what I should have said is we're the, it's the administrative branch of the world citizen government. And then that might've made her think differently. But, but I said yes to that. And she's like, well, I'm a little bit worried about losing my job because <laughs> if I stamp this document, that's like the government of Canada recognizing a nonprofit and I don't have the authority to do that. So I'm really sorry, I, I, I just don't want to, I want to stamp it, but I really don't feel like I can. So, you know, this would happen to Gary so often where a border official would completely understand what he, what he meant symbolically as well as legally, but were afraid just because of their, just their personal life. They had a family, they had children or whatever they, they had to feed and they didn't want to lose a job that, that they had, that, you know, that was feeding them, putting food on their table. So uh, anyway, um, why was the World Passport created? That was one of your other questions. Well, Gary, Gary was being detained uh, because he had no documents from 1948 through about 1954. He simply had no document. He did have, I think he created like an original sort of world citizen uh, identity, uh, but that wasn't exactly like a passport. So he said, look, uh, you know, uh, necessity is the parent of invention as the expression goes. So he needed a document. So he, he called up his dad because he didn't have any money. He was basically, you know, his entire adult life, he was sort of like Thomas Paine, you know, the, one of the, the, the people who sort of helped create this American uh, democracy, you might call it, um, and, you know, who was sort of a pauper, died a pauper, <laughs> you know, Gary was not, not a, ever a really a wealthy person, but his father still had money. So he called up his dad and his dad gave him, I think, a thousand dollars so he could produce, you know, several thousand world passports, one for himself, but then others to give to refugees and stateless people, mm -hmm. um, sort of to follow along the same lines of uh, Friedhof Nansen. Uh, Nansen was a Norwegian explorer, but he was also the first uh, uh, high commissioner for refugees. His Nansen passport office between, uh, I think it was like 1920 and 1929, issued thousands of passports to uh, refugees who were, you know, had fled after World War I. And believe it or not, the Nansen passport office won the Nobel Peace Prize for their work. And World Service Authority and the World Passport is really the successor. We followed in the footsteps of of the Nansen passport to keep that going. Because of course, once World War II started, uh, they, they stopped issuing any kind of passport themselves. And basically that was shut down. And even now the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, although they help so many refugees on a day-to-day -day basis with you know, supplies and food and medication and care, or even help to resettle people, they can't stop the nation state system from warring. They can't even produce their own passport because the nation states won't let them. They sort of have their, their hands, you know, in, in handcuffs. So they, even though they could, would issue a world passport if they could, they, they cannot because the, the nation state system, the, the UN system will not allow them to do that. So we've had to really take up that role because it doesn't exist anywhere else. In fact, Gary had a, uh, a friend who used to work at the United States Department of State, which the Department of State, of course, is the foreign ministry here in the United States, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and they said to Gary once, look, if World Service Authority closed its door on a Monday, for whatever reason, or was shut down, it would have to reopen on a Tuesday, because what you are providing is so crucial to so many people in the world. I mean, right now, and this is not my, my figure, or um, this is from the World Bank and other institutions who say there's at least a billion people on planet Earth who don't have any documents. Now, of course, Gary Davis would say the world passport is really an anti-passport. It's really an anti-document. Why should we have to have a document to identify ourselves, to claim our human rights? But certainly it makes sense why we might want to have a document to prove that a property ownership or to prove, you know, like with our medical records or so, so that someone doesn't steal who we are, like steal our identity, obviously, right? So it's important. Documents can be important, especially because other authorities demand them for someone to, you know, purchase real estate, to someone to purchase um, some kind of conveyance, like, a, you know, a, a, an automobile or something, or even maybe a, a bicycle, you might have to show some form of identification to do that. So there's a lot of people who are still excluded, you know, about a seventh of the world's population is, is excluded from that system. And sadly, 
especially in sub-Saharan uh, Africa and in, in many parts of Asia, uh, majority of those people without documents are, are women and girl children, especially. Uh, it's really discrimination. And we're just coming up to a World Women's Day next week. And this is here in the United States. It's, it's the Women's History Month. So we should be thinking about how we as one human family treat each other, you know, not just male or female or transgender, but how we just treat each other as people. So that's why the World Passport was, was founded to provide Gary Davis himself with a document so he would stop being arrested simply for having no documents, but also to help the many, many, you know, hundreds of thousands of people around the world who uh, have no documents and are suffering just because of that. Right. So, so that brings me to a, a, a question, because how did the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a UN uh, document and also the actual, um, the actual declaration itself, that was ratified by 48 states, including Denmark, which I'm of myself. Mm -hmm. How did that um, come about? And, and what's the connection to, to Gary Davis and the World Passport? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because not many people know this story. Uh, maybe you do, maybe that's why you asked, but if, if, if it's not, then you're very, you're very prescient. You know, I mean, you're predicting sort of the importance of this question by asking it. So let me get to the answer already. Well, uh, Right after uh, World War II, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, the, the, the first lady, you know, uh, she and uh, uh, Henri Cassin in France and a few other people got together and said, look, how do we prevent uh, another world war? Well, if people's rights are respected wherever they are, then that's oftentimes what, what leads to initially low level violence, which then expands to higher level violence, which then becomes interstate violence, right? International war, or, uh, and not just even civil wars. And so they said, we have to, we have to write down our rights uh, in some format, almost like a, not exactly a world constitution because we don't have a world parliament. We don't have a, yet a really uh, functioning world court of human and environmental rights. We need that. We actually, we actually do have, have a, a, a statute for a world court of human rights, which we can talk about later. But um, anyway, so they, they, they were saying, look, we cannot just talk about our human rights. We have to put them down in writing uh, to help us to fulfill the, the mission of the United Nations, which is was to rid the world of the scourge of war, really. Um, so they got together, they you know, had committees over several years, um, and then they had various drafts, which kept getting rejected uh, and vetoed by, uh, usually it was this, at that point, it was the Soviet bloc countries who were really, because the declaration promotes a lot of civil and political rights, not just economic, social, and cultural, cultural rights, Excuse me. And historically, there was always like this east-west divide uh, between rights, meaning like in the west uh, part of the western part of the world, uh, legal scholars uh, and jurists and all were promoting, especially civil and political rights, uh, meaning you know the right to vote or the right to freedom of speech or the right to religion or whatever else, right? Um, but on the uh, eastern part of the world. These were more people in support of uh, economic, social, and cultural rights, but not so much civil and political. So there was this divide, and that was partly why I think the Soviet bloc did not want to uh, to vote yes on this, was because they saw too many uh, too many rights of the people that could then change the government and perhaps overthrow uh, a government or a certain regime, and 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 they didn't want that. Well, uh, finally, uh, after many votes. Uh, Gary Davis actually, and this is where Gary comes in, in, into the picture, right, and why we still promote the, the declaration to such a great degree, was uh, he had been giving, as I mentioned, giving these great big speeches to audiences, uh, European audiences, and on December 9th, uh, he gave another speech um, calling upon you know, the people of the world to come together, that we, if, if we have, if we have rights, we have to have a regime of law, of world law, and like a world parliament, for example, that helps us as humans uh, identifying ourselves first and foremost as universal or human beings, um, sovereign beings, uh, that we have these rights, but we, ha we have to make it in a sense legal. It can't just be like a wish list, so to speak. We, we have to engage these on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we gave this big speech and uh, you know th this you know, all the newspapers were reporting and all the news media, the, the newsreels were reporting, the radio was reporting this big speech that Gary Davis gave. 
And the vote on the next, the, the vote on the declaration was the, the next day on December 10th. And there was so much pressure to recognize the rights of humanity, you might say the rights of humans, that uh, the Soviet bloc countries did, didn't veto, they abstained. So they, they just did not vote one way or another, but right. that allowed the declaration to move forward and to pass. And that's really how that declaration came into being. Now the declaration is just a declaration, meaning the most you might say under uh, maybe the, the Vienna Convention on, on treaties or on, uh, on law is um, customary international law, uh, where parts of the declaration might be viewed by many countries or most countries as, uh, as the law that should be, you know, in a normative framework recognized, right? Uh, and of course, that's why there were two later uh, documents which form the what's called the International Bill of Human Rights, which are the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which almost every country in the world, even the United States, which doesn't like signing treaties, has, has signed and ratified, uh, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Those two documents together with the Declaration of Rights, really, those are, those are treaty law, meaning if a government, a national government, has, has gone through their parliamentary system to ratify it and agreed upon it, then it's then it's not only international, it's national law too, and the government has to respect it, just like they respect their own national constitution. But of course, there's a lot fewer governments that have recognized the international covenant, or not a lot, but definitely fewer, have recognized the international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. I mean, for example, the US government says, well, you should be able to vote, you should be able to have free speech, but I don't care if you're on the street and have no job. It's kind of, you know, and this is why still there's this a little bit to some degree a Western, Eastern, or maybe Northern and Southern hemisphere sort of dichotomy between rights where, you know, certain parts of the world might better respect civil and political rights, but less respect economic, social, and cultural rights. But that's how the declaration really be, became passed. And I, so I love to say once again, to give another uh, shout out on behalf of this new documentary, uh, the world is my country.com. Uh, and you can, by the way, you can download the documentary, the full documentary, if you want, or just the hour documentary, um, and, and see uh, uh, the story unfold. And even hear Gary Davis, who was filmed before he died. He died about eight years ago, but he was filmed for many, many years, for about 20 years. The film um, uh, director and producer filmed him in many different locations around the world, talking about human rights and, and telling his story, which was what becomes this documentary. Uh, he talks about this in the film. So if you want to learn more and hear it from... Right. The, the, the person who made it happen, which was Gary Davis, definitely go, go watch the film. And another po uh, positive thing is this film um, is going to be on, it's called Link TV, which is through Dish Network. I don't know if they have Dish Network in, in Denmark, but it's one of the big, you know, uh, like, I, I don't care, can't really call it cable channel exactly because people now have, you know, wireless, but but that's that's one place where maybe you could look into your local providers, you know, in Scandinavia to see if something called Link TV is available there, because then you could watch the film. Although once again, it is just the hour version. And by the way, if any of your <coughs> viewers are interested, I am happy to do even for perhaps like a Zoom uh, of the film where we can get the director and the producer to come and talk a little bit before the film and then watch the film and then have questions and answers afterwards. That's another way to be able to have viewers who may not be able to have access to it immediately Right. to do it. But we're also, of course, trying to get it out there on stations, bigger stations like, you know, HBO or Netflix or something, which are around the world. You know, that's maybe the next step. Yeah. So my, my two questions. The first question is uh, when when uh, Gary Davis was doing this speech at the same time when they were trying to get this declaration, was that a speech he did at the UN in the General Assembly or was it just in public? That speech was not at the UN, as far as I can recall. I mean, there's, I have to, I just actually reread My Country is the World, you know, a few months ago, but there's so much information in it that I, I can't remember exactly. I, I know somewhere I have like a timeline of all the, all of Gary's speeches and, and where they were, but I don't think that was, that was one at the UN. He was given a chance. There, there was a time when he, that was another thing that also made him famous was uh, Gary and about 20 other uh, people who supported him, including, um, Pierre Berger, who's very well known as one of the co-founders of the uh, Haute Couture uh, uh, clothing house of Yves Saint Laurent. If you've heard of Yves Saint Laurent, you know, you know, well, Pierre Berger was one of the co-founders and he was a friend of Gary. Uh, and he actually went to into jail with Gary, believe it or not, back wow. in, uh, yeah, in, in 1948. 
um, because, because of interrupting a general assembly session of the UN calling for a world parliament. In fact, in our most recent newsletter that just came out, we, we, we give a, it's called, it was called the Oran Declaration. Um, you know, Oran, which is a city in Algeria, uh, because it was a, you know, it was a, a place that um, uh, Albert Camus, you know, the French existentialist, had, you know, had much interest in, in Algeria and what was going on between the French and, and the Algerians and the, the, um, the occupation and all. Um, so anyway, that speech was started by Gary on the balcony of the UN, and this is also in the documentary. You can actually see Gary reaching over the balcony, yelling, you know, I, I interrupt you in the name of the people of the world who are not represented here. You know, uh, that's how we started the speech. And then all these, you know, UN, you know, police officers were coming in trying to pull them off. But what, they were so smart about this, they had people stationed in all the different balconies in other parts of the UN so that they could continue the speech in French in you know, uh, uh, German, in even Esperanto, the language of hope. <laughs> uh, so the, the speech was given you know, over the next like hour or so, basically Gary and these world citizen activists took over the UN to talk about uh, world citizenship. Um, so that was the one time before he actually was unofficially invited back to give a speech uh, to, to the UN about moving beyond just uh, nation states speaking to each other sort of as a, a venue or forum for speaking, but not really legislating because the UN is not a world government. It it's cannot govern for one and it cannot legislate, meaning uh, we the people are, are not represented there and we're still not represented there. And I have to say, sadly, uh, Gary, Gary would oftentimes say, oh, uh, UN, uh, nations don't unite, only people do. Uh, he was not against the United Nations. He wasn't really ever against anything, really. He was always for, for or did things or, or, or was being a world citizen. Um, but uh, he would say, look, I'm, you know, the, the, the different agencies, the 25 or so agencies of the UN, like the Food and Agricultural, the International Labor Organization, uh, you know, the uh, UN High Commission for Refugees, et cetera, these different agencies really do help people on the ground who are in need, who are starving, you know, who are dying, et cetera. So they do really help. But that's just a, that's just a, a temporary measure, a band-aid, as we call it, you know, a, a, a bandage over uh, over the problem. It doesn't get to the root cause of the problem. We need to get to those root causes, and in, unless we can govern as with you know one human voice, uh, which we can easily do now online. I mean, through uh, online meetings. Uh, and I have I just put out a new um, a blog on World Service Authority's website, which is worldcitizengov.org, worldcitizengov dot org is our website um and on the blog page you'll see a blog uh, call, it's called the dow and the dow um <coughs> uh, finding a path forward to govern the world so what what is the dow and i'll get this is getting to the point of why i'm, I'm saying this well there's and you probably heard of this if you're all interested in uh cryptocurrency uh like you know ethereum bitcoin solana all of these uh you might have heard of DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous organizations so in my new blog, I put forward this idea because DAOs have never really been used to govern like really a community. They've been used to govern um, groups of people, you know, a group of people who have a certain interest in making something happen, either through online, you know, in the, in the metaverse or perhaps offline, you know, dealing with property or there was a group of people who tried to buy a copy of the US constitution. And that was a, a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. But my link of the DAO and the DAO, when I say the other DAO, I mean, like Taoism, meaning um, the path forward or uh, the, the sort of universal interconnectedness that we have as humans to the earth and to the galaxy and to the universe and the multiverse, right? And the metaverse within <laughs> and the universe in each of our brains. So um, I think it's an interesting way to look at how we can start governing our world, even in, even in a decentralized way where we can govern our local community, but even bring communities together, governing locally, but governing globally too, if we choose that. So all, Gary Davis was all about coming up with new ideas, new ways to provide an alternative to the system that is that we, that allows us uh, to kill and that kills us. I mean, what I, lo I love to do is, is to take take a ballpoint pen and say, look, you know, why, why has this become, uh, you know, so popular, although now it's being, you know, displaced by, by this, right? <laughs> you don't really necessarily need a pen uh, anymore, or you certainly don't need a typewriter. But, but this was created because, you know, previously we had a, a, a bottle of ink and a, and a quill, right? And that was how you would, you know, at least calligraphy or handwriting cursive, correct? 
um, before we had a typewriter or computers or anything or the printing press. Uh, but so there was a guy named Baron Biche, uh, a, a French baron who, it wasn't his idea, it was, I think it was a Lithuanian I, a man who came up with the idea of encapsulating the ink you know, in a tube so that you wouldn't get ink all over your hands or all over the paper. And so why did this displace the, the quill? Only because it is a better model, it is a better tool. So Gary said, why don't we create a better tool, which is this idea of a world citizen government, a government of, by, and for the people of the world, that we, the people, determine how we will run our world uh, and once again, as I said, we're, we're not even there yet. We're, we're only functioning in, in microcosm, not yet in macrocosm, but we're hoping that people will start recognizing, especially with, <coughs> excuse me, what's going on in the world that's impacting us, whether, you know, it's Greta Thunberg who's made such, you know, important, you know, you know uh, call among young people to say, look, we, the older people need to look at how we're treating our, our earth. Um, not just her, but you know, there's so many people talking about climate, uh, climate destruction and, and what we humans could be doing better or what we could be doing to, to, to stop that. Uh, but also the pandemic or also war or the pandemic of racism and injustice. I mean, there's multiple pandemics going on which, which are oftentimes human, human created like, like racism, like war. We, I mean, we can stop these, but it's a choice. It is a political choice, it is a social choice, it's an economic choice. We have to make these choices. So. Really, in the end, it's, it's, it's like creating this better tool uh, and hopefully people will flock to it. Well, you know, why do people flock to, to mobile phones? Because that's better than a landline phone in some respects. Why are people using that versus like a, a fixed computer on their, on their you know, office floor? Because you know, a laptop or, or now a phone is, is even better because you have your computer in your hand at your side at all times, right? So it's a better tool and people flock to it. This is really what we're trying to get people to realize that that we, we need to, we're, we're acting in Gary Davis's whole adult life from when he was 26 till when he died, when he was a couple of days before his 92nd birthday, um, was to be a, a, um, an activist for, for change, basically saying we could be like the trim tab on an airplane or the rudder on a boat. You turn the rudder just a tiny bit and the whole ship goes in a different direction. So we're, in a sense, we're paradigm changers. You know, we're trying to, to wake people up to say, look, we're, you know, the, the uh, earth is not the center of the solar system. The sun is, <laughs> in a sense, right? You know, moving to a, a different view of, of who we are. And we need, also need to say that, you know, humans aren't really the, the sole purpose of this planet. You know, in a sense, the earth itself, it, it, you know, is, is a, has its purpose in, in and of itself, even if we never, humans ever existed. And if we do want to continue to exist, we have to, we have to see ourselves in a different way. We have to start identifying in a different way, which really brings us to the idea, you know, what you're trying to do to help people to self-identify. And what we're trying to do is to say, I th we think it's great that people self-identify and, and uh, through self-sovereign, trustworthy, secure documents, but also to, along the way, identify at that highest level, or at least for now, as world citizens. I mean, once, once we meet and Gary Davis always thought for sure there has to be extraterrestrials out there, right? He was a big fan of Star Trek, the, you know, the Star Trek TV shows and, yes, and movies, which already saw humans together. I mean, if you if you ever studied, you know, Gene Roddenberry, the, the creator of Star Trek, his whole idea was humans were already together on Earth. It's just when they went into outer space that sort of the ugly violence of the nation state sort of reared, reared its ugly head, uh, you know, so it was, but there, they still talked about a federation of planets, right? Uh, it wasn't just, you know, and, and that's really what we're saying is that we need some kind of federation of, of humans. We're not trying, people always think, oh, you're trying to get rid of the nation state or, or even local identity. Not at all. We're trying to protect those. <clears throat> and the only way to protect those is to <clears throat> accept sort of a, a sovereign status beyond them, to come together at that higher level so that we can then protect those lower other levels and celebrate them. Yeah, so, so what, we, what we're trying to do and what I'm promoting a lot in this is really starting with yourself, educating yourself and start to govern yourself. You don't need government to govern you. No. And actually in the United Nations, uh, in their charter or in their constitution, the definition of a nation is actually fits a human being. So each of us in our own right is actually a nation by definition. Then it makes sense to create a nation with more because every single part of that nation is a nation unto themselves. So, and so we, we're starting also with, you know, starting getting the right ideas 
and getting those lined up and then um but in this world we we do need to you know identify especially at borders and, and especially in these times and so there is a transition where things will have to be a little bit you know uh, rocky boat but um so I, I would like to get back to the Universal Declaration again, because sure. in 1948, so if I understand your, your conveyance of it correctly, it was actually uh, because of a lot of uh, Davis's work that kind of also helped push uh, the declaration through. I mean, I know it was in the aftermath of the war, so it made sense to, you know, uh, pick up the pieces and, and repair stuff again, but he was a, he was a driving uh, force in that. Uh, um, well, so, yeah, I mean, he was a big supporter of the idea of the Declaration of Human Rights because he, as an individual without any documents, saw himself as as uh, almost like a, a, a subject or a slave to the nation state system. Mm-hmm. If, if he couldn't show that he had rights outside that system, then he was nothing, you know, or he was considered persona non grata. Mm-hmm. And he, he didn't want to see himself that right. He felt like he didn't realize, of course, until he gave up his citizenship, handed out in his U.S. passport at the embassy, that he would leave basically uh, with not almost with nothing, because at that point, you know, human rights had not been yet, you might say, codified or ratified into law by many countries at that point. Yes, I mean, it was it does appear in national constitutions like the U.S. Constitution and the French Constitution or other constitutions that had mentioned rights in them, right, or at least had added those rights later in a Bill of Rights. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he felt, well, at the world level, if I've left that system, does that mean I have no rights? And Gary Davis did not see himself as stateless. He saw himself as world full, <laughs> meaning right. that he was full of an understanding of the world, a love for the world, love for uh, his fellow humans. Uh, and he felt like he had to have rights. So, of course, he and the, the uh, group of people who were supporting him uh, all of like the French intellectuals, the expatriates of other countries who were found themselves in Paris at this time, were all supporting. Him. It wasn't just Gary. I can't say that it was just okay. Gary. That's wrong to say that it was just right. Gary. Of, of course. course, of course not. But I mean, Gary was very good as an actor. Uh, he was very good at getting the media's attention, right? So that's part of why he was so successful in, in yeah. his entire adult life, getting you know thousands and thousands of newspaper articles, radio interviews. TV interviews, uh, all, you know, focusing on what he wanted people to focus on, which was really world citizenship. I mean, world government, he felt was just like Emery Reeves said in that book, Anatomy of Peace, was really sort of a, um, uh, an unwanted necessity almost, you know, uh, that we, we don't really want this, but we feel like we need this, at least temporarily, to, to structure. Like you said, we might go through some difficult times to structure yeah. the world until we don't need that structure really anymore. So, um can I ask you the other two documents that you mentioned? Has uh, has your organization been part of forming those, or are they well, kind no, of like- the, the international covenants? Yeah, no, because those were formed. I mean, Gary may have to some degree back because those were formed back in the in the in the late fifties and early sixties when they started, <clears throat> excuse me, developing the international covenants on civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights. And I think they were both mostly ratified by the late sixties, right, by many countries. Although it took till nineteen ninety two. When the U.S. government ratified the International Covenant under President Clinton, it took a long time. I mean, there's still conventions that aren't ratified, like the Women's Rights Convention, which should be. I mean, we're in the Women's Rights Month or Women's History Month, uh, the Children's Rights Convention. There's others. I mean, probably the one of the most ratified treaties in the world is probably the Convention Against Torture, because you know there's this law called Jus Cogens, which is like a peremptory norm of international law. You might say it's like uh, demanding that all governments re- respect some, you know, what would be called non-derogable or non-violative, violable rights, meaning like the right to be free from torture, the right to be free from enslavement, the right to be free from ex post facto laws, the right to be free from being killed if you're a civilian during wartime. Well, we look at all the civilians who are being killed during war, and I'm not just talking about the world's go- wars going on now, but the wars that have gone on and the wars that I'm sure will continue to go on if we maintain the system of of these equally sovereign nation states that have the power and the nuclear power to destroy us all. So, uh, Gary, I mean, there was a lot, besides Gary, I just want to reiterate the, reiterate yeah. the point that there were a lot of people, uh, jurists and lawyers, and just even the regular public. And what, what really, I wish I had the book here, I have it at home, but there's a book called The Politics of World uh, Federation uh, by a professor named uh, Joseph Rada. And it's a wonderful two volume book. And if you start reading this book about 
the, the politics of World Federation, it talks about all these amazing people um, who were involved in trying to, well, one, you know, get the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, uh, ratified, but also other treaties, and to bring the world together, uh, you know, towards a world governmental system beyond the United Nations, right? You know, I mean, so were so many people back in 1945, 46, 47, uh, through the early 50s, uh, until the, really the Cold War really set in, who were, you know, so involved in trying to uh, move us toward uh, a system that was not viewed as like the League of Nations, because so many people felt that the UN was just going to be another failure like the League. Now, of course, the UN has done some amazing things for many people over the, over the years, but it still hasn't rid the world of the scourge of war. And, and my feeling is that uh, it won't, not in its current format. And do we want to reform it from the inside? Can we even reform it from the inside? I don't know if that's possible. So, I mean, yes, there's a <coughs> Article 109. There's a charter in Article 110, a charter review conference that can be uh, can be conducted to review and change the charter to make it into a governmental world governmental system where we the people maybe there's a people assembly there's groups of people in around the world who are supporting a United Nations parliamentary assembly but even that's not exactly the full ultimate goal of having like a, a real people's assembly that you and I get to vote on who represents us uh, at, at the world level. If Actually, we Actually, what I think, and I've been discussing this with several other people, uh, we have noticed that uh, all the flags on the UN building, they were taken down, which is actually an indication that the UN is no, the UN charter is no longer in effect. Because when, again, when one of my mentors, uh, David Wynn Miller, he talks a lot about the flag right. and what it means. It's a contract. And when you take the flag down, the contract is no longer in effect. So actually, we could be sitting in a situation right now where there is no UN in the in the way in the form that we used to know. Right. I mean, oh, that's positive news because, like you say, we need to have a change to get focus on the human rights, especially now with you know post, hopefully post pandemic, but where people has basically been used and 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 pushed into being an experiment. Because there were no vaccines, it was never a vaccine. It doesn't fit the legal or the the, the scientific definition of a vaccine. So so people have been used and pressured to be an experiment. So it, again, that violates the human rights, and we really need to put a focus on that. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, let that alone. Uh, there's so many other examples of people being used as as experiments, yeah. not just in, in science, but just in day-to-day -day life and how absolutely uh, how military the, and everything yeah, yeah. the military how communities are set up and how people are excluded you know racially or ethnically or yeah. religiously or other things in people's yes. communities and you know how the city are planned things how i mean it's really sickening to me and i don't know uh, you know whether this is like this in, in denmark but um where in certain states here the people you know the, the voting laws are changing to really exclude people from voting and it's oftentimes uh, people of color, it's people uh, of lower uh, income or means who are being excluded from voting because, of course, those are the people who would probably be voting, you know, on a liberal or democratic vote rather than, you know, a conservative one. So mm -hmm. it's kind of sickening to me to see that, that you know, in, in a country that's supposed to be democratic, <laughs> that, uh, that people are being used as an experiment to see how can we control, you know, the people and control the, the, the future of Humanity and exclude people from a fundamental human right of, of, vote, of the vote. So I, I would also look, like you to, to talk a little bit about, I know you have other documents than just the passport. You're also into um, other kinds of certificates, birth certificates and stuff. Sure. Yeah. Well, we issue multiple documents. We have the world passport. We have a world ID card, a world birth card, a world birth certificate. As I said, we still register people as world citizens. So you do not, you do not give up any other uh, allegiance or sovereignty, your own sovereignty when you register as a world citizen, all you're really doing is saying, I am aware that there is a humanity and that there is an earth and I wanna support my universal rights and duties. And I wanna make sure that, uh, you know, I res respect the earth and other people's rights. It's, it's almost like, um, what's it called? Um, natural law, uh, yeah. you know, respect to other people's rights, you know, make sure your own rights are respected and, and do no harm, right? In a sense, that's, that's this idea of, of world citizenship, you might say. Uh, and uh, so you don't give anything up. You're really just adding that higher awareness. Um, that's, that's great. That's great you, you, you put this uh, to speak because 
I'm, I'm sure there's also people that might be a little bit, you know, worried that maybe well, they hear citizen, they hear citizen, they think subject or slave, and that's not exactly. Term. I, I, yeah. I can show you just a, in, uh, <laughs> this is a very interesting that this is a Danish national passport. Mm -hmm. Look at the inside, like a word says a thousand, uh, a picture says a thousand words. This is, oh, a, so. you see the slave? Yes. So they, yeah. they really advertise here in graphic form how you're tied arms and legs and everywhere. Wow. Uh, I've never seen anything like that in a national passport before. Oh my gosh. That is insulated. That is insulated. <laughs> wow. Everyone I show this, they actually, even the ones that have it, they haven't seen yeah. that picture. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, oh. that's not at all. When we say citizenship, all we're saying is really a recognition of rights and duties that are now actually global, if not universal, right? And that we, no matter where you find yourself on planet earth, no matter how much money you have in your bank account or pocket, no matter what you look like, no matter you know what you believe in or whatever else, right. you have rights and duties that must be respected fundamentally, no matter where you are or who you are. So that's really <laughs> what it means to, to say, I am a world citizen or to register through World Service Authority to confirm it, you might say officially, politically, legally, symbolically, but as well. Um, but then those are, there's other documents. We have a world marriage certificate. And for many, many years, since I came here in 1992, but even before that, uh, people in the LGBTQ community could get our world marriage certificates. So didn't, it didn't have to be a man and a woman. It could be, you know, whatever couple uh, wanted to get married. So we've been promoting and supporting that um, for many years. Uh, we have a um, uh, world political asylum card for people who are facing persecution and want to have a document that says, look, help me, you know, because everyone has a right, even in the Declaration of Human Rights, it says everyone has, Article 14 says everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy asylum from persecution. So we have a document that proves that. Um, and uh, for people in the professional media, we have a World Media Association press card, uh, but uh, to promote the idea, Article 19, which is right to freedom of expression. But let me go back to give some examples of how these have been helpful. The World Birth Certificate, for example, there was, and I won't mention countries, so I won't offend anybody, but there was a country where there was a couple who had, uh, their, their child was born in this country. They were not ethnically, uh, uh, they did, were not born in that country and they were not of the same ethnic origin of the of that uh, country. So that government refused to identify the child, would not give the child a birth certificate. And that meant the child wasn't going to be able to go to school, wasn't going to be able to see a doctor because the child, you know, as a baby, oftentimes child, children are sick or whatever and, and needs, you know, just some medical care. So um, they asked us to issue a world birth certificate, which we did. Uh, we should send it to them. And then we also added, we don't always do this and we do charge an extra fee. It's kind of expensive because it's really time consuming, but uh, an apostille, which is like a local notarization and then taking it to the DC government of authentication to put a like, a like a gold seal. They used to put a ribbon. I don't think they put a ribbon on it anymore, but at least a gold seal confirming that the certification on top of the document was valid. Um, and then, then they were able to bring that to the local authorities that then and show the birth certificate. They didn't have to get a local birth certificate. With that, they the, the world birth certificate that we issued was enough for them, the child, to be able to go to school and to be able to go see a doctor. So that's exactly how the lack of identification documents can impact someone and a child who doesn't even really, you know, who's a baby, doesn't even really have a full awareness yet, right? Yes. Um, yeah. uh, or at least can't ex express it. <laughs> Maybe they have better awareness than we do as adults, but um, yeah. so. Uh, that it shows how the, sadly, unfortunately, the importance of documents in our day-to-day -day lives, just to be able to, to get, go to school and to learn or to be able to you know, get some you know, health care or med medical care if, if you're sick. Um, and, but so that was one example. Another example uh, uh, of our marriage certificate, and once again, I, I don't like to call out countries. Uh, so there was a place where there was this uh, couple, and this was a man and a woman. It wasn't you know, a gay couple or anything, it was a man and a woman. Uh, but this country was sort of conservative and, and this couple wasn't married according to the law or according to the, to the, the house of worship that, that they, you know, they lived with. Um, so the state or the apartment you know, landlord did not want to give them, uh, rent them a, an apartment, which is ridiculous. This is two consenting adults. They were probably about you know, 28, 29 years old. They're two consenting adults. Uh, uh, who, so then they got our world marriage certificate they showed that to the landlord and then the landlord was able to, without having, having any flack from the city government, was able to rent them the apartment. So this is kind of ridiculous. Once again, just because of the you know, uh, anachronistic, outdated uh, viewpoint, uh, you know, or maybe political viewpoint of a certain people who might be in power, that prevents you from exercising rights, even right to, to live together you know, as a couple. That's ridiculous.
Yes. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. um, so this is some examples of how our, our documents have been helpful. Sometimes, for example, even our World ID card, which we, by the way, we are updating all of our documents. So I, I encur might encourage your audience to certainly get our World Passport or maybe get the World Citizen Card Certificate or, or the, like the birth certificate. You might want to wait on some of our other documents like our ID card or birth card, uh, because we're going to be upgrading those in the very near future to, to look so, similar to you know, some of the self-sovereign IDs, you know, plasticized maybe with a QR code and all that could link back to your perhaps your cryptocurrency account or to some other account that you might want to share with others, uh, you know, your, uh, an exchange information. But anyway, so we'll be upgrading those. But just the ID card is another example. Uh, there was a fellow, out, he lived out in California here in the United States. And um, oftentimes uh, he didn't have a, he didn't have a state issued driver's license. He didn't want a state, a state ID. So he used our world ID, but that was enough for him to, to go to the local uh, gym and work out. It was enough to, for him to get a library card and, and get books from the library. It was enough for him to get a, you know, a mobile phone and, you know, as proof of ID so he could get a mobile phone. Uh, it was enough for him to get on a train, you know, a, a bus or whatever, and, and purchase tickets and, and other things and go to the pharmacy and, you know, collect his, his medicine or whatever. Um, so it was really helpful to him in his day-to-day -day life just to have that. And another example of that, we, uh, um, uh, for many years, we uh, had our office next to an immigra a U.S. immigration lawyer who was actually from Ethiopia, though. Um, and right after September 11th, 2001, a lot of his clients who had come to the United States from Eritrea and Ethiopia with nothing but the clothes on their back, they might have come with like a brother or sister's passport. And then they, of course, they had to hand that in and it wasn't even their passport to begin with, but it got them here, right? Well, he was trying to get them asylum here so they wouldn't have to go back uh, to the country where they would be persecuted. And they started being rejected in the courthouse because they had no photo ID. And he knew what we did. So he came to us and he sent his clients to us. And then with just our world ID, the clients were be able to were be able, were able to pass through right. the uh, court, you know, the courthouse uh, gates. Basically, there's the marshal service that says, you know, you, you know, not only should you pass through this metal detector, but you need to show me an ID or whatever. So mm -hmm. that was enough to get them into the courthouse so that they could have their day in court. And then, of course, as their lawyer, it was up to him to represent them and say, here's why they should get asylum. That you know, that our, our work was sort of done by that point. But, yeah. but anyway, it's amazing how just having an ID with your photo on it. Can dramatically change your day-to-day -day life and making facilitating things because because people are so used to you know uh, seeing seeing we have two versions of the password one that says world government and one that says world password you know just seeing a document you know what I mean uh, yes, just yes. seeing one is enough to to get you through that gate that yes. the, the, you know the gatekeepers are, are blocking yes yes great so uh, yeah um, I wanted to go. Uh, Back to the, the World Passport again and, sure. and ask you, because I'm sure there's a lot of people that are kind of like worried if I if I register my data with you, will the government find out about it? And what about my social security number? Does it go in there and, and stuff like that? Maybe you could settle that out. Yes, people are concerned about their personal privacy, their personal data. I mean, of course, we, we think it's good that there's the, the GDPR, the, you know, the general Yes. Uh, data protection regulations, and we follow those. We have to because we do have people in that part of the world where that law exists. But we would want to follow that anyway. Now we do have a privacy and a you know, like a usage statement on our website, which gives the full details. So if anyone wants to see it, they just go to the very bottom of the, the homepage on our web, website, worldcitizengov.org, to see it. But just to uh, summarize. Uh, the data that is given to us, you do have to sign a data consent, which really we didn't have until a couple of years ago when that GDPR went into effect. But it basically says that that you opt in to share your data. But in fact, if you're going to get a document from us, like the World Password, you have to share your data pretty much automatically. If you don't share your data, like your photo, you know, your image, um, or, or a copy of an ID, or a notarization, or at a minimum, a fingerprint. Um, we, we cannot issue the document for you because we have to have your photo. We can't issue, you know, a, a blank, you know, a blank world passport with no, with no photo on it. it, it exactly. It, why even have it? You know, just show yeah. your hand. So, <laughs> you know? so, yeah, but the question I think is, is does your organization work together with government exchanging oh, right. data? Yeah, no. So all the information that we get is, is internal meaning uh, it's not shared with any governmental authority with the exception of the world citizen government, which is really the, we're the administration agency of that world citizen government, but we don't really have any treaties or links with other national governments. So we do not share that data with anyone. I mean, the only people we have to share it with is just our staff who's creating the documents. Like one of, of my colleagues would say, David is, 
is this, does this look right? You know, we might not be sure about the spelling of a, of a, a place uh, and we look it up on Google, but then we're still not sure just because Google says it's right doesn't mean we agree. So we have to go back and email the person and ask them, is this, is this how you want it spelled? Because there's different ways to spell, you know, different cities in different languages. So, but I have to give a, you know, a caveat to that. So there um, are occasions where we might be required actually by law to share information. So what, what, what do I mean by that? So over the years, we have been visited by, you, know, you name it, uh, what I like to call control authorities or control agencies, whether it's FBI, uh, CIA, Interpol, uh, State Department, IRS, um, you know, Postal Service, whoever, have come in send, sending you know, their special agent or whatever to ask about certain cases of people where they think you know, might uh, have you know, committed a crime or harmed somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and what I really appreciate is when they come with a subpoena and a subpoena is, you know, is a demand by law that you fulfill certain informational requirements to them. Uh, and so we, you know, of course, we, we, we actually ask for that from these officials, please, please provide a subpoena so we can, because then we're required by law to share it. So certainly your viewers should know that uh, if they, you know, rob a bank, <laughs> uh, you know, and especially if they rob a bank and they're carrying the world passport, that would be a stupid criminal to do that because, I mean, you know, this sets you apart already. You know, you don't issue these in the amount that, you know, the European Union issues passports or the U.S. government issues passports. So already when you're carrying a world passport, you're setting yourself apart, you know, right. you're, you know, as somebody in a sense different from the standard person who's just going to have a Danish passport or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, we might be required by law to share actually information. Uh, but that, like I said, that very rarely happens, uh, you know, occasionally, well, pre pre COVID, uh, you know, maybe once, twice a year, somebody from some agency would come in with, you know, usually with a subpoena saying we, we need this information. Can you share it? Uh, and then we have to determine, you know, we, we ask them some questions like, you know, is this because the person's just simply trying to exercise the right to freedom of travel or ID? Or have they harmed somebody? And then they usually then they provide some information about how there's this investigation going on where they put a bomb or they were gave material support to you know a terrorist or whatever. So there are occasions, you know, sadly, where people do some heinous acts where they do harm other people. And of course, we're not here as a service authority. I mean, that's the name of the organization, World Service Authority, we're a service to control. But there are poli legitimate policing agencies that do help people who've been victimized or harmed, right? Uh, and so we don't want to stand in their way. In fact, we want to help uh, those agencies or those policing forces because we don't have our own world police force, at least not yet, <laughs> uh, to, to do that. So, of course, we're going to help those agencies when they when they need it and provide the legal basis. That makes sense. Yes, that. That makes sense. So, <laughs> yeah. so your viewers should know, look, this potentially could happen. But as long as you, the viewer, are, you know, like I said, following natural law, you know, do no harm, uh, make sure others do no harm and keep your word. Well, you have nothing to worry about. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you were mentioning something about page six and seven in this passport was special. Um, could you elaborate more on that? Yeah. So let me just show those pages. So there's um, an affiliate. Oh, the sun is coming in. Sorry. There's an affiliation page here and page yeah. seven looks the same. Uh, so basically it's, it says, you know, diplomatic core organizations, mm -hmm. firms. So it doesn't have to be specifically an affiliation that you might have as a diplomat. It could be, um, it could be a family seal or crest. It could oh. be a, it could be a QR code. In fact, there's there's a few uh, people in the in the tech industry, you know, in, in information technology, where we've issued their a passport with a QR code and a blockchain code actually, which oh. links to a specific account that they want public, so that when they show their passport and someone you know says, oh, can you can you send me some funds or can you send me, you know, they'll say, well, here's my account to, to link to, 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 to exchange those funds or to exchange ideas, even whatever. So we've actually used the password almost as a digital password already, believe it or not. And that's going to be upgraded. We hope, we hope too, both to make, you know, this password, both a physical and digital document, and maybe even have like a passport plasticized card in, in the future too, which might be easier to carry around than, than the paper thing. Uh, once, you know, governments stop stamping, uh, you know, at borders, you know, which they're stopping to do a lot. But anyway, um, so the affiliation page is meant for you, the passport holder, to yeah, add yeah. your particular uh, information, family crest, seal, insignia, logo, or, or even flag. We've had people, you know, of, of newly independent nations or tribal nations 
who had their flag, put their flag in. If you have like a, a metal hand seal, you can put like a gold star and crimp the, the star with your you know seal. But we also, for a fee a per page, we charge, a, I think it's now a $30 special label fee. If you have a specific document or uh, sometimes people ask us to put their profession, like they're a chef at a restaurant or something, they say, can you put in, you know, uh, that I'm a chef. And of course, we because we don't add uh, anymore. We used to a long time ago, add profession to the world password. We don't do that anymore. But okay. if you want us to add something like that, we could add it. We charge, we put in like a clear label. And on that clear label, we can add the, the logo, the seal, the flag, the the, the words, and a, a shrunk down version of your apostille or, or, or affidavit and put that on there for you. Uh, we can do it. And then we laminate over that to protect it. So we can do that. If you have the capacity to do that, you know, in your office or home, of course, you can do that. Those two pages really, and the other page, which, re, which is really left for the password holder, is the, the very back part of the world yes. passport, yes. Which, which, you know, basically you can put your home address in pencil. We, we suggest, you know, not in a pen, not permanent, but write in in pencil your, you know, address. So if the password's lost, maybe someone will get it back to you. And we've had many passports, you know, found where they're mailed back to us, and then we can get it back to the individual, um, okay. you know, if it shows an address or something. So no. those are the three places where you, as the password holder, since it is your document, we encourage you to, to do. Now, of course, we wouldn't want someone putting anything heinous or derogatory in there, obvi obviously, uh, you know, because there are obviously some symbols that unfortunately carry negative connotations, which, you know, you, you know what they are. <laughs> I see there's a, there's a page also for adding children. Yes, correct. So we really do encourage every password holder. In fact, it's really sort of one of our just internal rules. Uh, but we do make exceptions where every every individual, whether they're you know five seconds old, meaning they've just you know come out of the mother the mother's womb or their mother's stomach if it was the cesarean, right? As soon as they you come the baby comes out, we could you know you can take a picture, we can issue a password. So you can be you know less than a day old, and we can issue you a passport, right? Your your parent or legal guardian would have to sign obviously for you, and if you're a baby, you can't do that, right? Uh, so they can have they can have their own document. We encourage it because most places in the world, every individual who's traveling must have a document. It can't just be that you are listed in your parent's document. However, we do, for children, we do add um, in a parent or guardian's passport, but usually it's a parent. Um, the, the child's, there's just really three or four things we provided, which is the child's family name, the child's given name, their photo, um, their... Um, date of birth and their gender. Uh, so that can be helpful if you're traveling with a child where in a place where you, the child doesn't need their own document, but then that sort of proves that, the, you know, yes, my, this child is part of me or with me. Okay. Is there any requirements in, in terms of location where the child was born? Um, yeah, there is, a, the, it's show, let me go, it's page four of the passport. Um, so, and once again, I don't know if you'll be able to see that. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, surname or family name, given name. Date of date of birth. Oh, actually, no, no place of birth. Just date of no birth. place of birth. Okay. Gender. No, no place of birth. It doesn't matter. I mean, really, it's kind of outdated to say place of birth because when people ask me, David, where were you born? I say planet Earth, and they might say, Well, where do you live? I say I live in my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> so uh, you know, it's it's irrelevant because we're all born as as humans on the Earth uh, yeah. of human parents. So there's two principles, and I haven't mentioned this before, but I think it's important to mention two principles about citizenship which every single country in the world, including the, the, you know, the world is my country, that is the, the world citizen government. And those are jus soli and jus sanguinis, meaning the right of the earth and the right of the blood. So many countries do both. Like here in the United States, you could be born on the land here, so-called on the land in the United States, like you know, in, in uh, Texas or Illinois or New York or something, uh, uh, you know, California, you are a US citizen, right? But you could also be born of, uh, parents who were considered you know, U.S. citizens, even if you were born in a, in a boat in the Atlantic or in an airplane or something like yeah. that, or in a, even in another country, as long as your parents are considered American, basically by heritage. Um, but there are some countries that actually only allow heritage, meaning like you know, your grandfather or your great grandparent had to have been uh, you know, a citizen of this country for you to be a citizen. So just because you were born there doesn't mean you're a citizen. And that leads to some really horrible situations like for the Rohingya refugees or the Rohingya uh, group of people who were living in uh, Myanmar or Burma, who many of them, almost a million fled to Bangladesh, uh, you know, a couple of years ago because their villages were, were being, you know, set on fire. They were being persecuted and they were never given citizenship, even though many generations of them had been born there. Hmm. So, uh, so for world citizenship, we say those two principles still pertain. We're yes. all born on planet Earth, so mm -hmm. that makes us, you know, human or Earthlings. 
and we're all born of human parents, at least as far as I'm aware. There may be some extraterrestrials among us, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know, but they're still acting as Earthlings, right? They're right. still Earthlings. So we're still born of, you know, of Earthling parents. So we're working by, by birth in it. And in fact, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, actually, you already are. It's just whether you decide to claim that, you know, like I say, officially, legally, and politically or not. I mean, people don't have to claim it. It, do it doesn't matter. People can get the world passport. And that's another question that people often ask. Can I get this passport without registering? I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a citizen of anybody but myself or whatever. You don't have to do that. There's only a couple circumstances where we actually require the individual to register. That is with the world marriage certificate, with the world resident, I mean, international residence permit, and with the world political asylum card. And just a quick ex explanation of that. With the marriage certificate, what we say is, look, you, in a sense, have to give a commitment to humanity as a whole before you can commit yourself to one other human being or at the same time. In a sense, if you don't commit yourself to you want to protect the rights of humanity, how can you want to protect the rights of, of your, of your you know, significant other, you know, of your right. boyfriend, your sense. girlfriend, or whatever, right? Yeah. So that, and for the residence permit and the political asylum card, it's in a sense saying, look, if I, if I can choose my right to res reside anywhere I want to on planet Earth and write that on the residence permit, I have to know that the Earth is one and that I have the right to reside anywhere I want to on the planet, right. or even, even on the moon, if you, if you can do that, right? <laughs> um, but uh, there's that. And then the same thing with the political asylum card. You have to understand that the Earth is one and you have the right to be free from persecution and find a safe haven yeah. anywhere. That so makes sense. Are, those are the other reasons why we ask people to register and get that sort of basic awareness for, for those three items, but not just for the passport. Makes sense. Makes sense. I have a question about because I got my own uh, my own passport here. Sure. You have something called exit visa. It's a yellow piece like sure. this, and you can yeah. see it. Can you yeah. say something about that? Because I've been asked myself also about it, and right. well, I would so, like to get it from you. Yeah, if you read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 13 has two uh, two subsections. Article 13 one says everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. You might say that that's what the international residence permit is affirming, the right to residence and to choose your residence where you want to live, right? No one should tell you that you can't travel on your on anywhere on planet Earth and live there. You should be able to, right? Even though that's not how the nation states treats it, but that's the way it should be. That's the way we're demanding that our rights be respected in that way. And then Article 13, Section 2 says, everyone has the right to leave any country, including their own, and to return to their country. Meaning, you know, when you have the right to leave, I asked Gary Davis this once, I'm like, the declaration doesn't actually say that we have the right to travel freely on planet Earth. It's like, yeah, but that's what it means because it doesn't mean like you get on an airplane, you know, uh, from say, you know, Beijing and you fly into to, um, Geneva. You're not just going to the uh, duty-free shop in the airport in Geneva and to buy some liquor. You want to go across the street and go to the restaurant across the street, right? Um, to actually be in Switzerland, you know, you're going there to travel. So, um, everyone has a right to leave. It doesn't mean just going to the, the, the duty-free shop in, in some airport and being the international, you know, still in international territory in a sense. You want to be across the street, you know, in the country visiting with your friends, family, relatives, or whatever, um, uh, seeing the sights or, or helping or whatever it is you're, you're there for. So uh, really, the international exit is, is an affirmation of the right to leave any country. And the reason why it's so important, and it's certainly much more important probably in the 1990s, but it's still, this still happens, um, where and this happens in certain regions of the world, especially in the developing world, where you might come across a border official who says, well, you need to pay me to leave. And it's really just to get a bribe in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, you show your passport, and you're like, well, you've got to get an exit visa, and that's $50 or whatever. Especially if they think you're, you know, you have some money, they might demand it. Well, you might open your passport and say, well, look, sorry, ma'am or sir, I've got uh, my exit visa already. You must respect this. So it's really affirming Article 13, Section 2 of the right, the right to leave. And, and this happens even to people in their own country where they, you know, where they want to leave their own country and a government official might say, oh, well, you can't leave here. It's almost like every country has become a prison, a jail yes. to, keep, to keep us in. So when we build walls, we're building walls to keep us in just as much as we're building walls to keep people out. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Can you say something about the residence permit? I know this is a kind of a new thing. I have mm -hmm. it here myself, too. Sure. Well, the residence permit... Uh, well, I refer back to Article 13.1, everyone has the right to choose their residence, meaning uh, when we say residence, once again, people are concerned that, you know, does that mean that I'm become a subject, uh, again, of the locality or of the state? And that's not, again, what it's about. It's saying, well, I'm claiming my right to be in this apartment or be in this building or be in this home, uh, that either I'm paying for that land or that place in a monthly rent or mortgage, right? You know, that respect, 
or maybe you're just passing through. There's a lot of people we deal with who consider themselves as, uh, as PTs, perpetual yes. travelers, right? And that's fine too. Um, and so you might be traveling through, so you might put a care of, you know, a C slash O, care of, right. in care of address in there. It doesn't have to be a, a permanent address or whatever else. You know, people can put something as specific as like 123 Main Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60624, you know, United States of America, if they want a specific address. And this can be really helpful for refugees who just come to a country yes. who want to prove their residence, right? Not so much maybe you and me who've been living here for a long time, right, in, in the place that we've been living, but, but mm -hmm. someone new to that place. But uh, it also uh, can be something more general, like just Chicago, Illinois. It could be just North America. We've actually had people put planet Earth. I think we may have had one person put Milky Way galaxy, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> something, which, I mean, it's true, right? That's yeah. what we call it, I guess. Uh, so that's not a lie to say that. Um, but, you know, how helpful is that to say Milky Way Galaxy? I mean, I guess it will be, could be helpful when, when you know, we do potentially meet up with extra, extraterrestrials and say, <laughs> okay, yeah, we're from the same galaxy or whatever, or at least from the same universe. Yeah. Um, so it, it can be something specific or something general. <laughs> That uh, I would like to uh, share something with you because I have my own here. I've had it for a while, mm -hmm. and actually, just to to let you know, it's kind of an endorsement for your product here or for your passport. Because uh, I went to the American Embassy in in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. and I was I had some papers that I wanted to have the American Embassy notarize. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there's a lot of. Um, I think it's the embassy in Denmark that is the heavily most guarded. Um, I, I walk right into the um, to the notary, and the notary accepted this and also the ID card with the picture as ID. So I wasn't using my Danish state ID because you know they register everything, your name and social security number everywhere. Sure. So this was actually endorsed by uh, accepted both by the. Um, of course, the guards at the embassy access, but also at the notary. That's so interesting. I'm so glad you said that. And that's, that does go to the point that you don't have to get these documents just for travel, necessarily. You, you know, going from one place to another. Exactly. You use them potentially internally for travel just to get on a train or, like you said, to get the document notarized. Now, I have to say sometimes banks, depending on the bank, will not accept it because they have their pri semi-private, at least, companies and they can accept or reject anything. They're not like a government that's really bound to respect your rights. But I'm actually, I forgot to mention this, so I'm glad you mentioned the, the term social security number again, because that was part of your earlier question. And I would have to say, we, that's not something that we ask for anyway. So really what we ask for when it comes to data is very minimal. It's something that any any pri you know, private investigator would find on you just probably looking at your social media online or something if you right. have social media. But I mean, basically it's your, just your given in family names, your birth date, your birthplace, your height or eye color if you're getting um, an ID card from us, your parents' names if you're getting a birth card or birth certificate. So it's very minimal. And then just some kind of certification, like I said, which could be a notary, like you said, a notarization. It could yes. be a copy of an ID, like a copy of your Danish, the photo and information page of your Danish passport. It could be your, a copy of the birth certificate. It could, be, it could even be just a fingerprint. Sometimes people are like, well, I don't have a hand. So we say, well, what about a toe print? You know what I mean? It's something that identifies yes. that it's come from you. You know, uh, and that is part of you in a sense, because really this document, in a sense, is a uh, a legal and um, symbolic manifestation of you. Because once it's issued to you, we are no longer the authority over that document. It is your personal property, and that is a big difference between your Danish passport, for example, Absolutely. your European passport, and the world passport. Once the documents, whatever the documents they are that we've issued, they are yours. You are fully and solely responsible for their use but they belong to you and no, no one should legally be able to take them away from you because everyone has a right to own property, which includes these documents. You know, and, and that, that's the experience that I've had having it. It's that if this is my document and that's what I say to everyone because there's no authority over it. Another endorsement I want to tell you about is that I actually managed to open a crypto account oh, also wow. using this as ID so I did, because I didn't want to use my Danish state ID. Sure. Uh, because That's amazing. That. I, offline, not now, but I want to ask you how you did that. Of because course. That would be Absolutely. some information that I would love to share with people who come to us because more yes. and more, obviously, people have crypto accounts and yes. want to yes. want to maintain their privacy using the documents that we issue. So please, I'm going to want to get that information from you later. Henry. But I want to say one other point because you know I always feel like it's important to share as much information as possible. And that is not everybody maybe have the same experience that you have. If someone right. looks 
a little bit different from you, if they're a different gender, it's yes. quite possible. Like Gary Davis was very successful, but he was, especially of course, at the end of his life, he was a, a white old man. So mm -hmm. there was the fact that he, you know, his, his race, or at least the way he looked, and the fact of his being older, gave, people gave him some deference. You know, they, they deferred to him to some degree, mm -hmm. but he was also very clever. He was very smart and he had used the document. It was his only password his entire adult life. Mm -hmm. So he knew how to speak to officials. Uh, he knew how to use like the the Obi Wan Kenobi from mm -hmm. Star Wars. The, the these aren't the droids you're looking for. Right. <laughs> kind of you know yeah. uh, uh, Jedi mind mind you know control that kind of thing. He he had that kind of guruish wisdom. Uh, but not everybody's going to to have that experience. And I want them to hear that now, even on our website when you apply on Absolutely. the application form. It says that there are, are limitations to this. And you need to know, I mean, there's already limitations to our rights that national governments do every day. We're, they're always trying to you know, restrict what we do and how we do things anyway, whether, yeah. you know, whether you're presenting a document or not. And now, so what, people need to hear this. Yes, there was a friend of mine. He got the passport because you know, I promoted it well. And then there was the uh, COVID lockdown and he had to go to Sweden just across, you know, this is our neighbors. And right. they actually didn't, they, they sent him back to Copenhagen because of the passport. So, I mean, yeah. but they, they, in my experience, and I don't know if that you can maybe confirm that, but it, it has a lot to do with if you have any doubts yourself, Yes. I'm doing something wrong. It's radiating out of you. <laughs> and oh, people yeah. are like, okay, maybe, you know, you know, we don't accept that or something just because yeah. they kind of sense that you're not sure about what you're doing. Exactly. But, we, uh, have, we have a, a little guide called the 10 P's, like the letter P, the 10 yeah. P's of passport usage, uh, like being present, meaning being there in the moment and know how to present yourself in the best light. Exactly. The first P being present or present, being patient, being polite, being professional, meaning, you know, knowing what your rights are, being prepared, maybe having a copy of that country's constitution and their bill of rights, if they have one, maybe having a, the copy of the Declaration of Human Rights that we send to you when you get this document with you so you can affirm it and say, look, your government's a UN member state. Are you saying that you're going to violate Article 13 of this declaration right here in front of me, in front of all these witnesses? So you're right, exactly how you have to be persistent too. So another P in yes. the 10 P's of passport use. I like that. That could be something I could send you like the graphic that we've created for that, that you could share that would with be great. Yeah, yeah. It, it is a little bit of a guide. And there's also a book called Passport to Freedom. And as it says, it's a guide, a guide for world citizens. Oh, it's it's great. Great. My country is the world. This might be a really interesting book for, and there's Gary on the back with his, with his world password and the earth. <laughs> um, you know, let me show it a little closer. Yeah, yeah. yeah I see that. Yeah. So this wow. might be a book that you might seriously, you know, consider getting. We don't have it in paperback anymore. Well, okay. maybe through Amazon we do, you know, through online, but we have hard, hard copies that we can send out. Um, so it is, you're right, it's how you present yourself uh, to, to the officials. And one other comment, though, that when you talked about Scandinavia and dealing with Sweden, there was a, this is another example of where the passport itself might not have been recognized for maybe crossing a frontier, but where it was a, what I would call a springboard to do something else. So there was a group of people who came to uh, Norway uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Afghanistan and uh, uh, Iraq. And they, they were refugees, you know, with at the height of the war in uh, Iraq, and then of course the war that was going on for many, many years in Afghanistan. You know, uh, they came to get asylum, which they did get asylum, which was good in Norway. But then they were having trouble finding work, and they wanted to go elsewhere. So we issued them the world passport. But you're right; I think they maybe even tried to go to Sweden, but the the, the Swedish authorities said no. So what they then did is they went to their local bank in Norway. They got a um, a Norwegian, well, the bank, well, I don't know what bank it was, but they got a Norwegian bank card, which had their photo on it. Mm -hmm. And that bank card with their photo on it, which they got just by presenting the world passport, was enough for them to travel to other parts of Scandinavia with that bank card so that they can then find work elsewhere. They didn't uh -huh. have to stay just in Norway. So this, the document, even if it's not itself recognized for the full purpose, perhaps of travel or, or ID, was enough to get them something that then they could use. So of once course. again, another purpose where it, people can find it useful. And of course, there's a lot of people, let me put it this way, there's a lot of you know, well-known people or others who really like what we're doing uh, and say, look, I'm gonna get that document because I just support the, even if they don't support the law behind it, they might support the symbolism behind it and say, I see myself as a world citizen, as a human with rights and duties, and I wanna respect that, I want others to respect that. I'm gonna just carry this around as a, as a symbol of that. So Absolutely. people get it, you know, who don't have necessarily, who are in a privileged situation, who don't necessarily need it, but who want it. 
I, I have another question, and this is from uh, one of my viewers, because uh, in the Danish passport we have, um, and again, the issue of documents decides the definition of, of what is on it. On the Danish passport, we have a, a letter P right mm -hmm. here at the top. Right. And of course, yours has the same. And then right. I said, it's not necessarily the same meaning as the other one. And when I talk to David, I'm definitely going to ask him, what is your definition of yeah. that P there? Yeah you're, yeah, you're not the first person to ask. And our, uh, the way we explain it is that, one, we want the passport to be recognized. So part of the, uh, you know, the, what, is, what did um, Shakespeare say? A rose is a rose. You know, uh, if by another name, meaning if it looks like a passport, then it must be a passport. So part of the purpose of formatting this document is to follow the International Civil Aviation Organization, also known as ICAO, uh, uh, ICAO.int, the format that they provide the public, really, anyone can see this, of what a machine readable travel document should look like. Okay. Uh, so they provide the, the, the rules, you might say, uh, of, of that. So we wanted our document to follow that. But when we put P there, all we're simply saying is that doesn't mean pauper. It doesn't mean poor uh, or, or what other, uh, you know, whatever uh, people might think it means. It, means. it really just means passport, which is the type of document that this is. It is right. a, it's, a, it's like you know, where the, the term passport comes from. You're trying to pass through a port. A yes. port is you know, a gateway, a, an entry into a, a place. I mean, yeah. we would say, look, when you go from like my example of Beijing to you know, China to Switzerland, you're not going from China to Switzerland. You're going from one part of planet Earth to another. There's, Absolutely. So there's really no port other than maybe the, the, the port, like a door, like in a ship or the door into the aircraft or something. Exactly. It, it's yeah. not, there is no, there are no port portals anymore. It's, it's one world. So the P, that's all it means to us. That's all it means. And we can, of course, if anyone asked, asked us to do that, if for some reason someone was concerned, we have a legal advocacy team that can draft a letter explaining the, the, the uh, designation P and the password that it only means, you know, password meaning a travel uh, a document that affirms your right to freedom of travel. That's exactly what it's about. Right. I'm glad you cleared that up because I, I was myself sure that there wasn't any hidden meanings in that. No. I think there is in the state passport. I don't know if you know this, but these passports are actually designed, the same with the um, driver's license. It's actually uh, Masons that designed this, just like the money. And yeah, they love to put, you know, hidden messages and stuff. <laughs> and I know your organization has nothing to do with those organizations, so there wouldn't be a equal no, I mean, sign between the these only two. The only thing you might say, and it's not really a hidden message, if you look closely, in the in the background on the pages of the world passport yes. you can't really see it in this picture but yeah. it's the words universal declaration of human rights in i don't know 30 languages that's wow. all that's in the background is in a sense affirming that we have universal rights that we ourselves have declared that we ourselves must claim and that we uh can exercise so right. that's really the only thing that's in the background that might someone might be like what is that saying in the background well that's mm -hmm. all it is it's the words universal declaration of human rights in multiple languages i haven't even noticed that. gary once said to me david we have one secret I'm like oh gary what's that secret and he's like we don't have any other secrets <laughs> I like so in, in the end we don't know we're, we're a transparent organization we don't have any secrets we want people to know that you know who we are, what we're about, our our the advantages, the difficulties. I mean, it, it wasn't difficult for Gary to be a world citizen his entire adult life to only carry the world passport. Like I said, he was detained a lot. And when you carry this passport, you become a human rights educator. You become a human rights activist. Absolutely. You have to demand Absolutely. in that peaceful, polite, professional, yes. persistent, patient, you know, yes. way that your rights be respected because they may not always be. And it's not for everybody. And we don't want people, you know, getting it who might think that they might not be adequately able to, to mm -hmm. use it. You know, don't. Um, but for people who desperately need it, it may be the only document in the world that they can get. Right. Maybe you should expand this whole thing to also to have like a world bank, world world citizen bank. That's an idea. I'm, I'm looking. In, I'm looking into that myself a little bit. So maybe yeah. we can get together and yeah, share ideas one. on that one. You can name almost any idea, and Gary pretty much he was so amazing. Thought of it. He actually talked about creating a world a world mutual abundance bank. Uh, we actually had he had created something called the World Kilowatt Bill, which was based on energy, mm -hmm. so that you know. All energy, all money is really 
encapsulation of energy spent, mind energy or body, you know, movement energy to build something, to make something, create something. So why not link it to something real, which is energy and not to gold, which, you know, you can't use gold for much really, uh, or, or certainly maybe water would even be better than, 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 you know, right now it's money's not really a currency. Most currency is not linked to anything. Right. Uh, so he, he talked about that and right not long before he died, he talked about creating something called the mundo, uh, like the euro, but the but mundo, mond, meaning like world, right, uh, in Latin. Uh, uh, it's not something that we've pushed forward, but I love I would love to see us move towards either building a, a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, maybe producing NFTs, you know, non fungible tokens and a bank that relates to to this that cryptocurrency that people can use outside of the the central banking system uh, to not to do anything negative, but for the positive absolutely uh, you know, uh, uh, culture and uh, protection of the environment of humanity, and not yes. not based upon um, you know proof of work or even proof of stake, but no. but other proof that will be environmentally sustainable. It has to be, or why do it? Yes, makes sense. Great. We can talk about this more. I'd love to, Henry. I, yeah, but definitely, I would like to come back and and do a follow up uh, and. Sure. Get the feedback here and uh, maybe even gather questions and maybe you can come on a live and I can bring the group that. on and do some Q's and A's. That would be sure. great. Excellent. All right. Okay. I think, um, yeah, we got through everything and I got my questions answered. So <laughs> good, good. Well, once again, we can do this again. People can feel free to call. I can, I occasionally will you know, have a Zoom meeting with just an individual. Yeah. If, if I have given enough notice, I am extremely busy. You know, like we all are with Zoom yes. meetings every day. Sometimes even meetings here in person at our office, we do have students uh, who uh, do a couple different internships with us. Law students, for example, who do our legal internship, uh, communication students who do our communications internship. And we have students, you know, occasionally from around the world who participate in those programs who I'm training. We have other staff who I'm training. So I'm, I am an extremely busy person on a day-to-day -day basis, but I love to do these kinds of uh, interactions, uh, conversing with and answering people's questions. So feel free, people should can email us to info at worldcitizengov.org. That's worldcitizengov, like a short for yes. world citizen government. But so worldcitizengov.org to email us there to go to our website. You can apply online. That's only very recent. It's really yes. Just I, I just assisted a lady uh, to to sign up and get the passport. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. So certainly, as you're sharing this information or as viewers watch it, you know, definitely ask the questions before you just dive in and get this. Absolutely. Last question. Yes. We want them to know, no matter what else they see online, we are legitimate. We've been doing this for 68, almost, you know, almost 70 years. We're coming up on the 75th anniversary of Gary Davis's interruption of the of the General Assembly of, of the UN and his his giving up his U.S. citizenship. So we're going to be celebrating that a lot of that in 2023. Definitely go to at World Citizen Gov is, is usually our um, our you know uh, handle or name for Twitter or Instagram, and you can find a lot of useful information. We did just put out our our uh, February March newsletter, which I think people will find extremely interesting. It does touch on you know wars because obviously we're, well, everyone's a little bit worried about you know the, the World War III that could be coming up. But certainly, let me leave on a positive note and say yes. uh, we all have rights, we all have duties. Yes, we are already one human family. We already have one Earth. We just need to start becoming aware of that. And that's the role of this organization. That's been the role of my ent entire adult life. I've been here for 30 years. Uh, I hope to be here for at least another you know, 15 or 20 before I hand over the reins to the next set of, of people. We're starting to do that with you know, young people being involved okay. in, our, in our internship programs. We also, and one other thing I'd put out to young people who might be watching this in, in Denmark or, or bigger in yes. Scandinavia or Europe is that yeah. we are having uh, starting world citizen clubs, meaning students, in high school or university or college could create a club on their campus that where they talk about these ideas, they even maybe challenge these ideas, but then take these ideas and, and thinking about, well, how do we take, you know, something that's, that's uh, happening globally and, and interact with it locally. And whether that's watching like the Gary Davis documentary, whether it's reading, you know, Gary Davis is oh, having speakers like myself and others come in, we would encourage people to do that and they can find more about that. And that, that website is world citizen club dot org world citizen club dot org people can find more information there or there is a link to it on our main website world citizen gov dot org i'll definitely share the links under this uh under this video and i'll also share you the, the link to you and uh, it's on a bit channel that i have and uh, yeah hope to see you again soon definitely henry thank you for your time thank you have a good day you too bye bye, -bye.